Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons gathering. Um, we're really thrilled to have OpsMix here again. Um, they've done some great work with their Spinnaker uh, operator uh, that's now available in operatorhub.io and on Operator Hub inside of um, OpenShift. So today we have Gafnith Ripala uh, with us, who's going to talk about deploying applications faster to OpenShift with Spinnaker, and, and there can't be anything better than deploying faster. Um, but doing it with Spinnaker is, is really interesting, and I think you'll all um, enjoy this talk. So, Gopnath, go ahead and um, introduce yourself, take it away. We'll have live Q&A at the end, and um, we'll share this, as always, on our YouTube channel and on our blog um, right afterwards. So, all right. take it away. Thank you, Diane. Uh, my name is Gopinath Rebala. I am a CTO of OpsMX. We, we provide continuous delivery solutions with uh, low risk deployments. Uh, we will go through what that means. We are based, we use Spinnaker as a base platform for the continuous delivery. Uh, we will talk a little bit about what the requirements are when you are moving to OpenShift and uh, what enterprises generally look for for their continuous delivery. Uh, and how the Spinnaker can help you uh, achieve those requirements. And at the end, we'll do a quick demo of a Spinnaker deploying to uh, OpenShift environment with deployment strategies like uh, rolling updates, blue-green, and also do continuous verification, automated verification to identify any issues with the production deployment. So generally what we have seen is the enterprises are at various levels of uh, maturity uh, in uh, adopting microservices, particularly Kubernetes containers and OpenShift platforms. So when they initially start moving from uh, monolith, multi-tier applications to microservices and in containers, uh, the thing that they look for is how do I deploy these apps in uh, OpenShift environment, right? So there are various tools that are available, the ad hoc way of doing it, but what are the best practices? How do I scale uh, once I start doing it? it it's also, uh, there is some, some amount of friction for developers in adopting the platforms, particularly when you are trying to do uh, different deployment strategies and deploying to OpenShift. Uh, is there a way we can provide a common templates to them, reduce the friction for the developers to come on board onto the OpenShift environment? And the last but not least is uh, usually in the delivery process, you have different stages, including building through Jenkins, uh, automated tests through Selenium or some other tools that you have, and then going to the uh, dev and promote to production. So in the shift left DevOps scenario, if you really want to achieve the velocity that you need, uh, you need to have the visibility that's uh, there for both for the developers and operations to see what's going on and where the problems are and quickly identify and solve them. And once you figure out how to do this deployment, get the visibility, you start getting into the issues of uh, uh, how do I ensure security for these pipelines so you can only deploy, only privileged users can deploy to the production environment, but allow everyone else to view the status of the production deployments. And how do I specify the policy, enterprise policy on uh, what are the requirements, for example, SOX compliance or uh, uh, compliance requirements or in the policies in terms of what kind of scans that you need to run uh, before it can be promoted to production? How do you enforce all of these uh, policies uh, for the users? Uh, last but not least is you need to have the audit uh, and reporting of the continuous delivery, uh, not just for compliance purposes, but also uh, to understand where the inefficiencies are and improve on the delivery process. Once we have that, uh, the enterprises start looking into saying, uh, does it, this solution that I have uh, scale to large number of applications and users that I have? Um, is it going to be seamless scaling or do I have to do something uh, extraordinary to get the scale that I need? Um, right? Since uh, enterprises don't only have OpenShift environment, they also are moving from existing cloud environments or something like um, you know, on-prem OpenStack. So is it possible to continue to do delivery to existing environments along with the OpenShift? 
uh, and how do I minimize the production failures? Once you start get getting to a certain velocity of delivery, you want to know uh, how do I manage my risk in there? Can I provide some kind of automated verification, not just testing uh, before going to the production, but you need to have <clears throat> deployment strategies that even you go to the production, can I verify and make sure uh, the risk of this new deployment is low and if uh, the risk is high, can I roll back quickly? So uh, once you, the purpose-built continuous delivery solution would answer all these questions for you. Um, instead of using some ad hoc tools that would allow you to deploy quickly, but will not allow you to scale or maintain. So this is where the Spinnaker comes in. Uh, Spinnaker is a purpose-built continuous delivery tool uh, that is built for multi-cloud environment, uh, provides a shift left visibility to the developers, provides um, <coughs> uh, the fully automated code to deploy. So. The, one of the things uh, with the delivery also is you want to be able to have the pipeline that you describe to the delivery a, a GitOps based or it's a code uh, de declarative system. You don't want that to be a another program uh, that you would write as a script uh, that's uh, procedural, that harder to maintain, um, and make that into a, a declarative system so easy to maintain and even if uh, there is a churn in the organization, it's, uh, everyone knows how easy to uh, go ahead with that. And, and the visibility of uh, the pipelines is uh, another important one. You need to have a clean interface that allows you to see what the stages are, where the system may be failing, and how it is promoting to the production. Okay. At the same time, you want to be able to reduce the friction in onboarding the users. So here, you should be able to provide templates for common best practices, um, and the developers should be able to easily use those templates to onboard new services and applications, at the same time have the ability to promote them to production uh, once the uh, dev testing is done. Uh, and the continuous multi-cloud deployments and rollbacks. So we also want to be able to provide the delivery system that's consistent across multi, multiple cloud environments. That is, if you're deploying to OpenShift environment, uh, uh, delivery strategy that available to you, this blue-green uh, and rollback capabilities or rolling update capabilities should also be available to you in um, AWS environment or Azure or GCP. Uh, so that gives a consistent view both for the developers and operations to allow uh, the deployments for the existing applications and new applications that are transitioning to the microservices and OpenShift environment. And so once the velocity is required, you want to minimize the production failures. Uh, these production failures also, the manual verification of these production failures at velocity is error prone. Right. So you want to be able to say, can I get a, the risk evaluation of what's deployed in production to know whether the deployment has risks in it that needs to be rolled back, or it's a low risk enough that you can continue this. So we'll also look at one of the examples on how to do this continuous verification. Last but not least is the visibility audit and compliance the ability to have the compliance stages plugged into the same pipeline um, that is being delivered to uh, your deployment environment and ensure that the policies of the enterprise are met. So at a very high level, Spinnaker provides uh, all, all these features, the, something called a managed pipelines. So here, are, uh, with Spinnaker, you can define these pipelines visually, and after they are defined, you can uh, you can convert them into templates, and those templates can be shared across organization uh, for the best practices. Uh, these pipelines also uh, can be orchestrated in a very complex way, where you can have parallel stages or serial stages 
and also make it very simple for easy ones, simple pipelines. So essentially, it makes it easy for simple applications to onboard. At the same time, you can scale the pipeline structure to a fairly complex one, which can be converted to the templates and <clears throat> used for a very complex orchestration deployments. Uh, the entire system is API driven. And so you, for onboarding new applications within an enterprise, you, you don't have to, someone doesn't have to come to the UI and create these applications. So once you have a structure that's defined, um, you, you can have a simple onboarding of these applications through automated scripts. And all these pipelines are declarative. You can save them in a JSON format that can be stored in the Git. And you can also sync the changes to the pipeline that you make in the Git with a new pipeline that gets updated in Spinnaker. Right. Uh, audit is also automatic. Any changes to the pipeline are all logged. Uh, all the approvals that go through the pipeline in terms of who initiated the pipeline, uh, who approved the pipeline to go through the production, all of that is also uh, built in. Automated risk assessment is uh, done through analyzing the uh, monitoring metrics and logs in the system. So uh, now with the distributed applications with a large number of microservices, the amount of logs that are generated is huge. Uh, some of these applications can run anywhere between 20 to uh, 40 microservices. So when in the continuous delivery mode, as a new application, new service gets deployed without change to any other services, you want to understand how that is impacting the rest of the application also. So in the continuous verification, uh, you can just plug in the system to interact with the logs that are being generated for the microservice, uh, along with the metrics, and run the analysis to compare the new deployment with the previous production deployment. So this one gives you a comprehensive score based on both the errors that are generated in the logs as well as differences in metrics like the latency metrics or resource utilization to, to identify if the deployment is risky or not. And it gives you a consolidated risk scoring. You can also set up uh, alerts uh, both based on uh, compliance, uh, well, um, <clears throat> compliant rules violations as well as the metrics uh, that we are collecting uh, for analysis. Uh, it also gives you a confidence score. Essentially, confidence score specifies if, if the data that is being validated is only for a couple of minutes, the confidence may be low. And if it's a longer, the confidence is high. Now we know that the system uh, is performing as expected. So we also get the confidence score with with every deployment, so along with the score to have um, insight into wh whether the score is optimal or not. We also support uh, centralized policy enforcement, um, where you can specify the, these policies of the enterprise. These are also declarative policies. You could specify every software that is being deployed in production must go through sonar cube scan is just an example so th these uh, policies can be specified and they will be enforced at the deployment time uh, if we audit all the uh, continuous delivery pipelines uh, on wh who's approving who's running the pipelines etc uh, any of these violations they get notified all the built-in notification systems um, common notification systems, including Slack, email, uh, those kind of notifications you can get. You can also do automated compliance checks. Uh, so, uh, so as a, a complete continuous delivery system, uh, going from a simple deployment to a complex enterprise-wide deployment with the OpenShift, we want to be able to provide all these features um, that allow enterprise to scale from the initial adoption to complete enterprise-wide continuous delivery for OpenShift and existing platforms. 
to, to do a quick demonstration. So here is the Spinnaker UI. It, it has the applications, which has the pipelines. Uh, there are two high-level features that uh, Spinnaker provides. One is the, the pipelines for deployment, and the other one is the application management with the clusters. Uh, <clears throat> so let's see if you can run a simple pipeline. Uh, So when you run a pipeline, essentially it has stages where you can specify what individual stage needs to do. In this particular case, it's doing a deployment to OpenShift environment. It's deploying a particular uh, service and a container that's connected to that service. So if you look at how this is configured, uh, this is a configuration you can set up the triggers based on the repository changes or Jenkins or uh, GitHub changes, any one of those. Once the trigger comes in, you will have the deployment. Uh, you can specify both whether to take the deployment from a Git or you can take the deployment manifest right here in, in place. Uh, so this pipeline has just completed. You can see the uh, deployment status of the pipeline. One of the advantages of using Spinnaker is also for the OpenShift environment, after the de deployment is complete, it waits until the manifest is stabilized. That means it's, it doesn't just do manifest apply, but it waits until uh, all the um, uh, requirements are met for the deployment to be complete. For example, if you're running five instances, it waits until all the instances are up and running. You can also see that the deployment is complete. Now there is a version two that is deployed. And for this version two, uh, you can see the details of the version two on how many instances they are running, which are the replica sets, and which load balancer it is connected to. Uh, and you can also see what is the status of each one of the instances by looking at the logs that are generated right in the same place. Uh, and in the group of these applications, all the services for these applications are also displayed. Uh, for the deployment, you can take the deployment actions right in here. You can scale the number of instances, or you can do a undo of this rollout to any of these previous versions. So it allows you to uh, have the visibility as well as the application management capability in place in one uh, location. You have the view of all the services that are available for that application and manage those applications. There is our back that you can specify uh, who can make the changes, for example. The other one is the blue-green deployment. It also will show you how is simple. Uh, you can specify the blue-green deployments. So here, all, all you have to do is specify the service that it needs to connect to. And once you specify that, uh, you can run the new deployment. What it will do is, as you know, the blue-green deployment is you apply the deployment uh, to a newer version. And once the version, new version is complete up and running, you switch the load balancer <clears throat> from the older version to the newer version, and then go ahead and disable the older version. So uh, right now, it is deploying a, a newer version, which is a 1.2 version of the service. We'll see how simple it is for us to go ahead and switch the blue-green uh, deployment. Here I put in a uh, manual judgment. Usually you would have a the automated verification stage that will allow you to check uh, if the new deployment is working properly. And once it is, you would go ahead and apply the changes that are required for the blue green. So you can also have this one to for deploying a canary deployments. If you go to infrastructure, now you can see that there is a new version that got deployed, which is, and then the previous version is automatically disabled. Um, 
So now that load balancer is only serving traffic to the, the new version. And if you go to the OpenShift environment, you can see that there is a new, <coughs> uh, new one, the, the deployment that we have done earlier. This is a new one. Um, we just deployed uh, in the deployment, and this is the one that is running for blue green environment. Another quick example here is this the automated verification. So as, as I was mentioning, you can build complex pipelines uh, orchestration with this one. In, in this particular case, we are doing a build with the Jenkins. And <clears throat> once the Jenkins build is done, we are taking that artifact that's produced by the Jenkins build and deploying it uh, into the OpenShift environment and then running an automated analysis on that deployment to verify if the deployment is functioning properly as well as both in terms of functional and performance. And once that is successful, we will promote it to the production. So, <clears throat> as you can see, this is a deployment that ran, you can, you will also get all the details of the deployment individual stages in place. Uh, you can see the Jenkins logs. You, you can actually go to the Jenkins from right here and look at the Jenkins logs. Um, <clears throat> and each of the deployments and tests that is run, you can get the details of each one of the stages. And the automated canary also provides you the score in an in integrated way and also provides you a link that allows you to see what uh, the details of the analysis are. So in this particular case, we are linked, the monitoring is done with the new relic. And there is a template that will allows you to select all the metrics that are being collected for that service and analyze those metrics. Uh, so you can also specify the logs to analyze. So if, uh, let's go to a better example. Um, here you get a comprehensive score and the confidence of that score. Uh, there are two things that are going on here. One is the analysis of the logs. Here the, you can see when we compare the logs, uh, it gives you the new errors or exceptions that are happening. It's uh, important to see that it's a new errors because if there are warnings that exist in the current system uh, and the new version or deployed also has the same kind of warnings or errors, then it does not surface them. So you'll only see the ones that are new, both in terms of errors or warnings, and analyze them to identify the risk of that uh, deployment. Um, you can also train the system. This is generally unsupervised uh, analysis with the natural language processing, but you could also train it to say, uh, for example, you made a fix to the system so that the, the warnings or errors that you were seeing earlier are not there anymore. So if those errors occur, you want to surface them. So then you would go and specify that uh, that particular item needs to be um, surfaced in a new version. So at, at this point, when we do the comparison between the old and new, um, the errors will show up all in the new system, even though they existed in the previous one, if they come back again. You can also identify some of these uh, line items and say, this is not an error that I don't want to uh, surface them. It learns that uh, based on the feedback that you give, uh, and then from the next analysis onwards, it will ignore those. And as for the metrics, it, it will collect all the metrics from the monitoring system for that particular service and compare the previous version with the current version. Uh, in, in this particular case, the latency is much higher and based on the latency uh, changes, it identified that the risk is higher uh, in, in this new deployment and uh, fails the deployment. So the template includes not just the service metrics, but also system metrics. If the pod metrics are enabled and they're being collected by either Prometheus, Datadog, uh, New Relic, or, or 
bunch of other monitoring systems already support, including Stack Driver. We collect all the data from them and analyze those metrics. Okay. So that's a pretty high level uh, view of the Spinnaker uh, <clears throat> deployments and automated verification with deployment strategies. Um, so essentially, it allows you to do as simple deployments with application onboarding and scale that to very complex orchestration with the compliance and audit requirements and automated verification as your organization grows. So here was one of the case study that we have done with uh, you know, Fortune 50 company that is transitioning to OpenShift environment. Uh, <clears throat> they, they started uh, off moving to OpenShift containers and uh, they were looking for the right solution that would scale with their increased applications that are transitioning from traditional to microservice platform. Um, so right now we are in production with them with uh, more than 1,000 applications. They plan to go to 3,000 plus. Uh, the, these are the applications we provide some templates that allow them to onboard their uh, users much more faster they provide self-service, so they essentially end users would come in, uh, specify which app they want to onboard, and the rest of the things will take in care, taken care of through the templates. So that the service gets built, uh, pushed to the repository, and gets deployed to the OpenShift environment, and there are policies that are specified that allows them to promote to staging and production. Uh, so the, 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 and, and the entire thing is uh, specified with the central control and compliance and audit. All, all the pipelines that uh, are currently run are compliant pipelines that allow for the enterprise-wide control uh, uh, on what stages that need, they need to go through before they go to production. They are SOX compliant. They support uh, this automated uh, verification uh, of the production deployments. And the plan is to not just support OpenShift environment, they are also moving, using Spinnaker to support OpenShift and um, AWS and some other environments they have internally. <clears throat> Spinnaker uh, is very easy to deploy. Um, if you have OpenShift environment uh, on premises, you can go to Operator Hub and simply run the application deployment. If you don't know what an operator hub is, it's a app store for the applications that run on uh, OpenShift. And the Kubernetes is also a supported platform. So you, you can simply go to uh, operatorhub.io operator and Spinnaker operator and install your application. Um, so that's all I wanted to cover today. If you have any questions or you wanted to go through detailed demo, we can do that. So I, that was actually great, um, and thanks for the the plug, and thanks for all the work you did to get Spinnaker Operator into OperatorHub.io. Um, it also um, has a whole whole good good crew of um, other operators as well. But there's yeah, there that's a great way to show it. So it's an easy way, whether you're running on OpenShift or any other Kubernetes. Um, to just download and install Spinnaker um, and and get running, get up and running really quickly. Uh, there's been a, a, a little bit of talk, and maybe what I'll do is I'll um, unmute Bali J, your colleague here, or he can unmute himself um, in the chat. Um, hey Dan, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Um, right. we, we're having a little bit of discussion about um, how the relationship between Spinnaker and Jen Jenkins um, here and and I was wondering if you just address that, that was going on in the chat. Well, um, if that's what you're talking about. Yeah, I think um, primarily is Spinnaker focuses on the, the deployment of the artifacts, um, you know, into various environments with, uh, with basically a, a very no scriptless way of deployment of applications and all the supported platforms. Obviously, OpenShift is something um, this audience cares about but the many enterprises actually have quite a bit of a, quite a variety of environments that they want to support. So that is where the uh, Spinnaker really shines because as the developers want to deploy into various environments, 
quantum scripts, um, different, different element strategies. Oops, we lost. Yeah, so, there you uh, go. I can I can hear a little bit of noise in the background. It's a pleasant noise, so don't worry about it. One thing I would like to add to that is, uh, it, it, from our customers, they can they usually start with Jenkins for deployment to OpenShift uh, using a manifest files, and as they grow larger, uh, they they start doing scripting, which gets complex. At some point, it becomes unmanageable. And one of the advantages of Spinnaker is that you have all the stages that are declarative. You don't actually have to do a bunch of scripting for most of the common deployment environments. And there is a built-in deployment strategies like blue-green that apply not just to OpenShift uh, or Canary deployments, not just to OpenShift Kubernetes, but also to AWS, GCP, and Azure environments. And they also get a consistent um, view of shift left view for these pipelines. So you can have the RBAC specified on these pipelines where the developers can trigger it, but the, there needs to be a privilege escalation that needs to happen to go to production. At the same time, developers do get the visibility of the pipeline uh, all the way to the production. They can see what is deployed to production and, and if the production system is working well or not. And through automated verification or the manual verification, they can see what the status is. So the shift left feedback from operations to developers, uh, essentially the core DevOps uh, really uh, shines in, in terms of Spinnaker and makes the uh, maintenance of the system as you grow with large number of applications, much more easy. Yeah, so the Dan, I'm back. I think <laughs> I think Gopi, Gopi covered that. I think the key part. I think what I want, one, only one comment I would add is that Spinnaker. You know, you deploy, you look at the logs to see what happened. I think Spinnaker, you can clearly see the different stages where where it failed, and you also saw the automated verification piece and and reporting on that. And the developers can do a one click rollback. Um, all of them, you don't have to write scripts for it because Spinnaker really takes care of um, creating clusters, you know, resizing clusters, changing load balancers. So think of all the CD functions, right? Um, so Jenkins is still needed actually for the, the build stage or the CI portion. Spinnaker does not replace Jenkins um, for those aspects. Um, so I think uh, it's a complementary solution but more people are looking at Spinnaker as an end-to-end -end, uh, solution for uh, CI CD. It also, uh, from what I, I, I've read and what I've seen in demos, uh, it also has a very good compliance and audit reporting um, component to it as well. So that's quite helpful. Um, I think- Yeah, so the, yeah, the, uh, the, the, C, the audit and compliance portion, uh, the audit portion, the, the events are there. Actually, Opsimax added the audit ability and the compliance checks aspect of it. So the open source Spinnaker has all the events, right? Has all the primitives, but um, in in terms of uh, you having to be able to use it, um, we actually have a, 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 a basically our version of Spinnaker, basically which is open in the sense that um, we don't um, we don't fork Spinnaker, right? We we just add a layer of uh, value add on top of Spinnaker. Um, this is um, near and dear to my heart as I used to do IT audits ages and ages ago. And this is something convincing people that we need this has really been very important um, in most IT um, groups inside of enterprises. So this is excellent to see. Um, the, you mentioned the Spinnaker open source project. Uh, how closely are you tied to their release cycle uh, when they send out new features and releases? Yeah, so basically, like I said, we, we support open source Spinnaker, right? Uh, that is our primary uh, product. Uh, we have a, a layer of, uh, we have not a, la it's basically another microservice. If you look at Spinnaker itself, it's about 10 microservices. So we have a, a another microservice that ties basically along with the next uh, next release of the Spinnaker release. So we just use the APIs um, to provide these value adds. And so we are completely in sync. That's great. That's always good to hear. Um, I'm looking to see if there's any other questions from the audience. Um, 
besides the ones that we've talked about a little bit in chat? Yeah, there's here, Stefan. There's some one one more thing. So we we discussed briefly the uh, multi uh, cloud or multi environments that you use for CD with SVU the compliance. Are there any other attributes which I could identify at customer saying, well, that's a good move now for you, customer, your customer from moving from from Jenkins or Electric Cloud now doing the next step for a more powerful. C the engine. So I, I fully get the multi environment, multi cloud environment. I get this compliance. Is there anything else when I say, okay, a customer has, has this challenge where I can then recommend uh, Spinnaker? Yeah. Yeah. You, if they have, uh, you know, if they need to deploy uh, applications safely uh, through Blue Green or Canary or a rolling update or Istio integration and rollback, yeah. if they have challenges, in all of them. I think the key part is that the developers get to choose it with one click, right? So if you have like, let's say a thousand applications and imagine you have to create custom scripts for any of them, people probably don't do it. You know, they just like, you know what? I will just do one way and one way and that's it. So with this uh, options being a pull down option for the developers, they can actually start doing safer release strategies. I don't have to be like, okay, I don't have to do scripting for any of these. So it's already available out of the box. Um, so now I will start implementing safe strategies. You can also integrate with Chaos Monkey. You know, I'm not sure that's a more of a advanced topic, which is basically a, a reliability analysis of, uh, of applications, right? You, you have heard of Chaos Monkey's tools oh, yeah. that Netflix talked about. It's natively integrated with Spinnaker. And so I think as you mature from sort of a you know basic uh, microservice deployment all of these things become an important uh, factor and netflix for example uses 6000 deployments a day right obviously that's extreme uh, but there's no way they could do this with any of the you know uh, sort of uh, other approaches uh, verification even or everything is automated so everybody is not looking at manual logs or errors and things like that, they're just fully automated. So that's, you want velocity, that's another criteria. One is multi-cloud, uh, other is a, you know, I wanna go faster, I wanna eliminate any manual steps if possible, right? There'll always be some things that you wanna do, manual verification or manual approvals, but uh, for most part, uh, if you wanna eliminate anything that's el eliminatable, <laughs> then, then uh, Spinnaker is a good choice. And uh, yeah, thank you, thank you for that. And for 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 example, for ISVs, which where you do software development and really don't deploy into production, you deploy into multiple test environments because your your software eventually is supported on AWS, on OpenShift, uh, maybe right. simply on mm -hmm. VM. So, is it still recommended to say, well, or uh, uh, go, going the next step from from Jenkins to Spinnaker? Is valuable, or would you say, well, uh, maybe due to the next level of, yeah, in quotes, complexity, it's not recommended for ISVs? So I would say is if you're going from, if there's a transition that's happening, you know, meaning you are going from a, maybe a VM type of deployment to a container deployment or some sort of a transition, you're trying to, you know, let's say, deployed a new environment. Mm -hmm. You used to be on-prem, but now you want to deploy to AWS or somebody else, for example. Um, but there's a transition happening. The point is why uh, carry the burden of the past by you know redoing the scripts again for different environments or different types of application rollouts? I think that's where I would look at the transitions. The deployments, uh, you said test environments, you know, that could be OpenShift cluster, that could be uh, AWS clusters, you know, it's not prob it's not production, so to say, to your point, but it could be still be some deployment environment, right? And yeah. so that that's still a valuable uh, not to have to uh, create it. Most people only look at things when they have to do it uh, for some transition, right? If everything is working, they probably don't want to like redo it just for the heck of it, <laughs> right? If there's a, I need to go reinvent everything again for some other change. Should I? Bother with my existing strategies, or should I go for go for a newer model? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Perfect. 
Well, thanks for that question, Stefan. Um, hope that um, covers off most of what everybody was asking about. Um, you have any final words, Gopath? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll add a final word, I guess, Gopi, you can add to as well. Um, yeah, if you have any interest in um, sort of a trialing or, uh, or demoing, uh, more personal demo or, or a POC, for example, um, shoot us an email. It's just simple. Hello, hello at opsmx.com. Um, so hello at opsmx.com. So we can, we, we do, we help people with free trials of Spinnaker. So don't feel shy. Uh, feel reach out and we will happy to help. So go past if you want to throw up right. your, your final slide, maybe with your contact information in there. Um, that would be a great place to land. Yeah, that's a good point. No. Um, yeah. So you can reach us out at opsmex.com. Um, so one good thing with Spinnaker is that uh, you can start small, uh, do a pilot for a small group, and that will allow you to uh, do the pre-OC, get comfortable with the Spinnaker, and it can scale with your organization as you scale to different groups and multiple environments. So uh, the <clears throat> we are at uh, opsmx.com. You can ask for a free trial that will allow you to uh, deploy either an OpenShift environment on-premise, or we can also do trial with us uh, in a cloud environment to look at the Spinnaker, how it works for you to deploy different uh, cloud environments. And you know, please reach out to us by simply going to info at opsmex.com or uh, sending us your email with the free trial. We'll allow you to download um, it started right. for your OpenShift. Yeah. So thanks very much for coming today. This is great. Um, you can also reach these guys on the OpenShift Commons Slack channel. If you're not there, um, send an email to me, dmuller at redhat.com, and I'll get you hooked up. Um, and again, we look forward to um, another update sometime not too distant future on new releases. And um, if you have a customer story, um, we'd love to hear that too. And um, if anyone has questions, please do reach out. Um, we, we really um, appreciate your feedback on this and, and all the other aspects of uh, the Commons efforts. So thanks again, guys, for, for coming today, and we'll talk to you all um, soon. And hopefully we'll see you at some of the Spinnaker events that are coming up. I think there's a Spinnaker Summit in November and a few other ones as well. So um, we'll keep you all posted. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.